Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much for coming along to this session. Uh, especially, this probably has the most uncomfortable seats in the entire building. So uh, I really appreciate you here sacrificing your uh, comfort in order to listen. Um, three things struck me uh, when I came to Research Ed uh, today. The first one was that uh, there's a sort of slight sense of um, panic because I'm never completely sure. I remember everybody's names that I'm going to meet and I really wish we could address each other by our Twitter handles. Um, the second thing was that there is a kind of irony around the place that uh, if you look at sort of syntheses of what's most likely to help teachers, then reading research isn't particularly high up there. So we're all kind of, yeah, research is really important, but not a huge amount of evidence that, you know, all our enthusiasm, enthusiasm is necessarily helping improve outcomes. Um, but the third one is that uh, research ed in many ways represents the best of what's happening in the profession, but also I think it has some echoes of some of the big issues we have in the profession. Um, and the reason I think that is because firstly we see the good, we see people who are wanting to solve problems, we see people who are curious, who are searching for solutions, we see people looking for new ways to understand and to teach. This is very exciting. However, it says something to me that Research Ed is almost a slightly subversive activity taking place on a Saturday. We're kind of all a bit special here in the nicest possible way, um, in as much as most people in the profession think we're completely mad uh, spending our time here on a Saturday because sort of research and education is not that normal, isn't it? It's kind of, we're here, we're, you know, we're going to be different, we're going to make a change. And that's almost a bit of a problem, isn't it? Research is kind of seen as, wow, yeah, it's the next big thing, and we're going to use research, and we're really being avant-garde, and we're going to do this in our own time. And the fact we're doing it in our own time kind of just shows how much this isn't part of the profession at the moment. Everyday engagement with research and evidence is not built into the day job as it, as, as it stands at the moment. So I want to, um, I have a mental model about, uh, about teaching, uh, which I'll briefly talk about, um, and then I want to kind of think about, well, what does that mean in terms of, in terms of research? And for me, I think we need to think of uh, professionals, uh, first of all, being able to um, be perceptive. And I think it's really important that we think of professionals who are able to understand what's going on in the classroom in front of them. They're able to use their senses, they're able to see, they're able to feel, they're able to hear, they're able to, well, maybe smell the fear in the classroom sometimes. Um, but they're very, very perceptive. They're able to use a huge number of very expert approaches to understand the learning that's taking place, the behavior that's taking place, the relationships. They're very perceptive of themselves, their own mental state, how they're currently approaching an issue. They link that perception to a deep knowledge of how learning progresses. These teachers are thinking, how do I take what I'm seeing and link it to what I understand about how learning is built, the sorts of relationships I'm seeing, what does it mean when I'm seeing different things in different children? They understand, they use their knowledge of how different sorts of children will approach learning. They understand, uh, as they are perceiving the particular relationship in front of them, some of the psychology behind it. They link their perception to their knowledge of the theory of what's going on. And then finally, they have practice, which then relates to that. So a great teacher has a huge toolkit of different approaches that they can use. These different practices that could be anywhere from the way they move their bodies to the sorts of way they use resources in the classroom to the way that they have conversations with people. But great teachers combine all of these things and underpinning it is that general passion for being a teacher because this can be a very grueling job at times but also a spectacularly fulfilling one. And on the days where it's grueling we need to be, we need to be nourished by the fact that on other days it's very fulfilling. But you can see when teachers often leave the profession, that kind of joy of teaching is gradually disappearing and they're less and less thinking about how much they love the job and all the other things start piling on top and eventually they get pushed over the edge. So for me that's, that's kind of my mental model of teaching and it encompasses the great creativity in the relationships but also not only what teachers do but what they're thinking and understanding and what they're seeing and perceiving. So that's my mental model. Now what I want to do now 
is I want to take an analogy. I want to take an analogy, and I'm going to stretch this analogy painfully far beyond the point where any analogy should truly be stretched to the point where you're wishing I would just shut up, I would stop. I'm going to take this way beyond anyone should ever take an analogy. But I decided to use the analogy of steak. In the process, I'm going to uh, probably offend vegetarians. I will probably bore some people, but hey, that's I get the pulpit. I'm going to talk about steak. So this, I'm going to... Um, I want to think about teaching and cooking steak, okay? I'm hoping this is going to make sense eventually. I told this to my colleagues in the, t in the trust yesterday and they just went, wow, that really is one of your more tenuous ones. They laughed because it was near the end of the day on the Friday, pretty much. So, first of all, how do I cook steak? I cook steak the way that the last TV program showed me and I think it was someone like Heston Blumenthal and he was on some cooking show and I cook steak by... I think I take the, if I remember rightly, I take the meat out early from the fridge and because uh, apparently you're supposed to do that, I don't know why, but you are. And then you heat the pan really hot and again, I don't know why, but I have a favourite pan and I heat it till I can see smoke and that's what um, Heston said. And I take my favourite tongs and I turn it over and apparently you do it every 15 seconds. I don't know why, but Heston says you do. Um, and then at the end of that, I rest it so that the juices don't run. They always run, every single time. The, the, it is a wash with juices that, that ran, but I still rest it because apparently that's what you do. I have no idea why I'm doing these things, but I'm told it's a good thing to do. Broadly speaking, my steak, eh, it tastes all right sometimes, but I would classify myself as a cooking moron. Really, I just kind of copy what other people tell me to do. Now, what does an actual chef do? Well, they're a little bit different because um, they might go through some of the same motions as me, but fundamentally, there's a few big differences. First of all, when you talk to a chef about a piece of meat, they'll start saying, oh, which bit of the cow did it come from? What's the texture like? How much marbling has it got? What's the thickness? How does that affect the cooking? And they'll have so much more knowledge about what it is that they're doing that immediately they'll start making better judgments than I will. And I don't know why I'm making any of those judgments, I'm just copying. Secondly, they're how perceptive are these top chefs? You know that thing you see chefs doing where they just go, oh, you just tap it, and then you can tell when it's ready. And I don't know if any of you could do that. I tap the steak, I have no idea what I'm tapping, it feels like steak. Um, but they do that, they tap the steak, and they go, oh yeah, okay, this is ready or not. And you, they, the way they're hearing the pan sizzle and the way, they can, uh, the way they see the meat, in fact, before they even start cooking, the way they look at the meat and they look at the marbling and some magic tells them how to make good steak. There's quite a big difference between a really expert chef and me. So then we say, well, how do we make me better? Okay, let's adopt a really good approach here. Let's do some observation. Let's do some observing the chef. And so, you know, someone's going to say, well, David, uh, I can immediately see some differences why you're not an outstanding chef. I mean, you're not wearing the outfit. That's, that's pretty key. So I think that's a clear, clear observational difference. Every outstanding chef I've ever seen wears this particular outfit. So I think you should do that. Second thing, they all do the tapping thing. Like, they all do it. That's clearly part of being an outstanding chef. You should do that. Um, next thing they do is... Um, they definitely they all rest the meat, you know, that seems to be really important as well. So I would say those are things to be an outstanding chef, you should do those things. I'll be, oh, okay, great. I'll try doing that. I think we would all expect I'll still be a moron, but this time we'll be a moron who's tapping the steak and wearing the right outfit as well. But my observations maybe will look better. Against that particular rubric, that particular criteria, they'll say, yeah, you do look more outstanding now, that is true. I mean, the steak is still pretty crap, sorry, but you do look better. So then we might say, well, I tell you what, let's do some CPD for you because, you know, your steak is still not as good as it could be. Ultimately, the outcomes are not good. So we're going to send you on a one-day course. It's going to be really inspirational, be in a day in a hotel, and people are going to share their stories of how they have cooked their steak and they're going to tell you these wonderful tips and tricks and at the end of that day you might feel really inspired and you'll have loads of notes you can bring them back and then you know hopefully you'll use those um, of course you know I maybe I make those notes I come back home and I forget to look at them they're over there because every time I make a mistake I just want to make the steak I don't want to go back and read my notes so then I say oh one one day CPD is not working the solution must be let's go in house great I'll get my dad and my husband they're going to come and they're going to stand next to me and say oh you know give me some tips no you should do that I'm going to share best practice for steak now Okay, so we're going to share the practice, and this is what I do, and this is what I do, and I heard this, and I heard this, it's really good. We might even go to Twitter and ask people for some ideas. So we're really focusing on CPD, we have one day courses, internal, sharing practice, it's fantastic. Maybe though, for some reason it's still not working, so we say, great, research hat on. 
Let's do a randomized control trial because this is going to start helping us get to the fundamentals of why you're not cooking the right steak. So we're going to take 100 cooking morons. And what we're going to do is we're going to find out one thing particularly we're going to decide them to do. So we're going to say resting the steak. We're going to do a randomized control trial, 50 resting the steak, 50 not. At the end of it, it turns out there's a significant effect, a great effect size. People who rested the steak first, there's an effect. Great. All the cooking morons, you can be better now by resting the steak. Okay? Doesn't matter why, you don't need to know, you just need to rest the steak, and that is going to make you a better teacher. Evidence based intervention on steak. So then that's great. We're going to put it into the Steak Evaluation Foundation Toolkit as quite high up on those things. And now the top things on the toolkit are you're tapping the steak in order to check it, because apparently that helps, resting the steak, having a really hot pan. Great. We're going to make all our teachers better by giving them a few practices that apparently work really well when you do them at scale. But I'm still a cooking moron. I'm still not the expert chef because fundamentally we're missing something really important, which is no one's actually treated me as anything other than a moron who can only be told you should just copy these practices. They said, right, we're, uh, we're not actually going to get you engaged in why things are happening. We're not going to try and increase how perceptive you are as a steak cooker. We're just going to give you some tips. And therein, for me, lies a problem with steak cooking. And then just, just segue gently, you might have seen some parallels with education. So, I, there you go. I really stretched the steak a long way, didn't I? Okay. So, now the thing is, it would sound as though the way we develop uh, steak cookers, stroke teachers, let's just randomly pretend I was talking about teachers for a while now. We, can, we actually would say, oh God, it sounds awful. We must be a dreadful profession. But the thing is, we're actually, we're really not. Apart from anything else, a vast number of us have just come out on a Saturday in September on a miserable rainy day, and we're sat, you guys are sat on horrible hard seats, listening to people talk about research. There is a great curiosity and burning innovation that goes on in in England and the UK. Now actually, when we look at how, what the public think of us, despite the fact that you know, it's not always reflected in the media, in England we're the third most trusted profession. We're right up there with those medics, the nurses and the doctors. We're right up there, we're really trusted, which is great because as a profession people vest their trust in us, they give us their children to look after, they give us vast sums of their tax money and they really trust us. We don't always feel as though that's the case and maybe there's a difference between trust and respect but wow we're doing a pretty good job somewhere if people trust us that much and you know what the classic data is the story in England is it's a terrible education system things are failing and actually hey anyone can cherry pick data but you know what if you if you misuse the PISA data you can try and paint this picture that we're doing badly but actually when you include lots of international data actually some ways of cutting it suggests we're pretty good this is a massive international report, the Pearson Learning Curve report, and on the academic outcomes, they reckoned the UK was the second best country in the world. That probably jars with you because you're so used to being told how rubbish we are. But the point is, actually, in some measures, we do really good stuff. So just think, if we can solve the stake problem, if we can solve the sign of slight superficiality that we often get with teaching and really deepen our thinking about our profession, just think where we could get to as a profession. We're not complacent, are we? Every single person in this room wants to close the gap. We still see, okay, we might be doing quite well in some areas. There are too many disadvantaged children not doing well enough. We want to be a really respected profession where people are hammering down the door because they really want to be in our shoes. And we know we're not there yet. We have a lot of trust, but not enough people are still saying, I desperately need, I want to be a teacher. We know that we want to help really encourage and nurture and share love for our subjects. We're never complacent. This is not a complacent profession. You can't be complacent in this profession. So, is it any surprise, really, truly, realistically, that when a lot of the work that goes on in education is extremely shallow and we're not given theory and understanding and depth in what we're told to do, is it any wonder that teachers sometimes grasp for straws of, I just want to know why this is happening? 
for me, it seems entirely inevitable that if we're not engaging teachers and saying, here is why this is working, this is the theory behind it, this is the depth of thinking behind it, here's how you can begin to explore how and why it's working, then people will grab hold of ideas like Brain Gym. You know, people are going to do that because they are looking for something to satisfy that curiosity. Why am I doing what I'm doing? How do I do it better? How do I figure it out? Now, for me, that doesn't say, oh, look at these teachers. How stupid are they doing brain gym? How incredibly shallow? No, that's not the case. Actually, these are teachers who are seeking truth. And the truth was not available easily, so they found brain gym, unfortunately. Now, that actually says that we as a profession need to do a lot better about structuring the way people are able to understand our profession so that we can inoculate ourselves against some of this nonsense so that people have enough information about how learning is taking place and how the pedagogy fits together that actually when someone comes at us with a slightly daft idea we can just say eh, it doesn't really make sense or we have enough tools at our disposal it's not just about mimicking things but it's about Let's really understand what we should be seeing if this is working. And then, is it also any surprise that in this absence of any logic of really why things are happening and just this is good practice and do it, we also get into this cardinal sin of statistical over-certainty. This is a toxic problem in schools where someone says, ah, this worked, this didn't work, this child is an A, you're a D, you're better than you, you're an outstanding practitioner. It is certain. I have decided this. It's nice and simple. Therefore, I have now measured you, and now I can just take action on that, and I will set you some nice targets. And it's the, the level of uncertainty is actually enormously high. But we're just saying, and never mind there's some uncertainty underneath it, or never mind by the time we've aggregated all this assessment data together, it's kind of meaningless. It's fine. It gives us a number. Right, good. You are behind target. You are ahead of target. I feel certain. I feel comfortable now. But again, if we don't have a framework for thinking about why things are happening and exploring in more depth, is it any wonder people just grab at the nearest bit of certainty and try and do something with it? So I really don't blame us for some of the issues that have occurred in education. So what I'd like to do then is actually spend more of the time just painting out a little bit of a picture of how do we change the profession, how do we change the system so that some of these problems disappear, but also so that evidence, so that research, depth of thinking is embedded deeply into the way we work, the way we act, the way we are as professionals. So I really love this phrase, a renaissance of educational scholarship, which I just read in an article only last week. And for me, it just suddenly captured that spirit of where we are headed as a profession. Educational scholarship, thinking deeply, questioning carefully, analyzing, going for depth. A renaissance of educational scholarship could begin to manifest itself in a number of ways. First of all, if every teacher considers themselves not a practitioner but a scholar, we will begin to ask why. We will think more deeply. We will stop sharing best practice. Hey, this worked for me. Oh, that's creative. I like it. But we'll start asking why. Why does that work? OK, you say it works. How does it work? How does it link to other evidence that we have? By starting increasing the pedagogical thinking, we will then suddenly have all this information which any individual one of us cannot possibly hold. It seems mad to me that we can say any single teacher should just, yeah, they should just know their job, that should be fine. We know, we've all reached out in research ed, we're reaching out and touching this expertise and this depth of thinking as we move around the different sessions, and it's exciting. So I contend that we need a system of specialists and generalists where the general practitioner teachers are the ones on the front lines who are the most important, who are making the relationships with the students, who have to have an encyclopedic knowledge of all the different areas which they can touch upon. They can then, rather than saying, if you don't know, you just have to pretend, just do something and be outstanding, we have a, a, a network of specialist professionals now, we begin to have many of these things already in terms of specialist professionals that work in pupil referral units or special needs schools or all these different sorts of areas, but we're going to tap the whole process in together. In the future, I, as a general practitioner in a classroom, 
will be not only looking out for issues that I'm seeing, but I will know a huge network of people I can turn to to say, I'm having a real issue here. How can you help me? I'm planning a new approach. Can you tell me the evidence and research? It won't be for me to have to do the trawl of all the research myself. How could I possibly start? I will work with an expert who has been deeply immersing themselves in that research and that expertise and who also practices and we will work together. Then there will be specialist centres in the same way we have pupil referral units now for children where we have some real behaviour issues. We will use some of those specialist centres to say this particular child needs a little bit more than I can give right now. Let us temporarily give them one day a week or a few days a week in a specialist centre around reading, around science, around numeracy, around behaviour. And we will get some extra specialist support working with me as their general practitioner, if you like, their general teacher, but also drawing on this vast array of expertise. And once we have that, the depth is available to us at all times. In the future profession, that depth is available to us because we can draw on the specialist centres and the specialists in order to improve what we do, in order to help us have the impact we're looking for. And we embed this specialism into the career path itself. It should no longer be possible in the future profession to go through 10 years of teaching without engaging deeply in the latest evidence and what is required. By establishing career paths, that it require us to think about what's been the latest evidence, how can I summarise it, how have I applied it to my own practice, how have I been working with specialists and how have I helped analyse and diagnose issues and how have I creatively brought together the expertise to make wonderful, exciting, infusing lessons. So a college of teaching will sit somewhere in this future profession. And then finally, one of the maddest things I, I always remember when I first got into teaching is when I started planning lessons. And I started planning lessons and I was sort of given a copy of a textbook and maybe a scheme of work and I said, well, what's the best way to do this? And they went, oh, you know, you come up with something and you do this and take that textbook and just grab what you've got. And I remember thinking, somebody out there has thought about doing a better way of doing this. Someone out there has thought of a better way that I don't have to completely reinvent the wheel from scratch. What I don't want is someone giving me a laminated lesson plan. I abhor, I, I am horrified by the idea of the laminated lesson plan. To go back to my steak analogy, hooray, to go back to the steak analogy, if someone gave me a laminated set of instructions for all steak, it wouldn't work. And that would make me no more than the cooking moron I was before. However, we can build in evidence to the tools we use from that point of view, why is it? Why shouldn't we be demanding that every worksheet we're given, someone says, OK, so why did they choose to use this particular series of questions in a row? How does that relate to how these children are going to learn? And uh, what should I be looking out for? What tools should I be using to look to, for, to see the issues? What are the common issues and how does that relate to the pedagogy? And where else might I look for some slightly deeper research about this? And, uh, you know, so, oh, this particular test you're using, then how do we know that really distinguishes carefully? Has it been carefully designed with the right expertise? Why can't we demand this? Why can't we demand that evidence is embedded in every resource that we use? So that our, our creative uh, drive, our entrepreneurial spirit as teachers, is grabbing the best bits that are around, that are built from deepest thought and careful work, and we're creative with them rather than just creative with whatever we can find and, hey, that's great. Let's build the evidence into every tool that we use. So we, it is systematic. We almost can't help but use great approaches that really help us make the right professional decisions. Now, often when you talk about building evidence in, people immediately see a kind of an, uh, an ogre saying, there is one way to do it. You will do it this way, and this is the right way. And I'm saying exactly the opposite, actually. I'm saying that we, we will be able to have that professional control and autonomy even more once we're, able, once we're able to describe carefully how every element has been brought together. I would love to see lesson observation change from just observing what the teacher does to a deep, careful dialogue where we start by getting every teacher bringing their exercise books their, uh, from, from previous lessons and showing what their scheme of work is and how they embed all the ideas that those children have previously learned and the information they know from other infamous sources about those children and then they start telling us right this is where I'm going this is why this is my curriculum 
Over here is what I learn about these children. And I can describe deeply and carefully how their pathway has led to the decision making for this next lesson. And then, working with the observer, I'll say, okay, so these are the things I think you should be looking out for. And after this dialogue that richly talks about my process of professional autonomy in designing this lesson, we watch the lesson together, and then we use all sorts of tools to help us understand what's going on in that lesson. And then in the discussion afterwards, we look at all the evidence we've got and how it relates to other ideas. And it's a deep, rich, professional discussion. I am sick of going into schools who have the eight things that all good teachers do. This is the basis for our observation framework. Everyone is observed against these, and we'll choose one for our performance management this year. Here's your one thing. Yours is going to be feedback. Great. I'm going to be better at feedback this year. It's such, oh, there's such a paucity of professionalism. It's so shallow. I mean, that doesn't inspire anybody. And I, I, we need to move beyond that and get this extra depth. We need to make sure not only that, but it's built into our schools. Now, this is a particular passion of mine. How do we make sure every workplace that every teacher is in is filled with workplace learning? Where rather than me being by myself, figuring out my own path, every person I teach, every young person, every child, every young adult, has the best of my understanding and the team around me. Because my school has built in the time what I learn from, I work with, I explore with my colleagues. We work together, not only in our school, but exploring from the best of outside our school in order to enrich the learning that's going on. This is a really exciting prospect that some schools I'm seeing are doing, and they're building in time where the workplace learning is exciting. It's enriched, it's deep, and people are really feeling intellectually and professionally challenged. So some practical steps. Here are things I think we can just get on and do right now. Teachers, join subject associations. Just join them. Just go join them. Do it right now. Join subject associations. Don't tell me you're in a primary school. It doesn't count. Get all your subject coordinators and join subject associations. The pedagogy that you're going to start getting will be deeper than any of this kind of generic nonsense that you often get in professional development. How to be an outstanding teacher. It will talk about depth of subjects and topics and it will start enriching what you do immediately. Join subject associations. They should be massively more membership than they have now. Keep asking why. We need to push back sometimes and say, don't tell me this is good practice. Why is it good practice? For whom? How do I know? Show me some evidence on this. Let's start having more challenging conversations, and Research Ed is an example of that. We've got to be more critical. My nightmare is the end of the today, everyone has arrived with a set of preconceptions, and we've all strengthened them. We've all cherry-picked things from every session, and we've left. So all the people who believe in a completely uh, project-based learning approach, which is completely experiential and discovery, will be absolutely more sure by the end of the day that's the case. And all the people who believe children should be sat in rows and reciting texts most of the day will be even more convinced that they are also correct. Because essentially, our mental filters will automatically mean that we say, yeah, OK, you know, you're right, that's true. I do this all the time. If I see a little single study that tells me that teachers improve in a nice, rich, warm environment, I'll go, whoa, look at this, this is really exciting. Whereas if you show me one study that says something that, I, is, frankly, I don't know, I don't really care for so much, I'll go, oh, well, you know, it's statistically insignificant, isn't it? And we all fall into that problem all the time. We've got to hold ourselves to much higher standards. If we want everyone else to trust us even more with more decisions, We've got, we can't stop, we've got to stop doing this. Or kind of saying, oh, well, you know, I mean, it doesn't really matter what that says because I just really believe it. You know, we've got to hold ourselves to higher standards. Professional debate. Who here's on Twitter? Who here occasionally hears some wonderful things on Twitter? Who here occasionally sees people being like childish, ridiculous, spiteful children on Twitter? Oh, my goodness. If we're a profession, let us create a thoughtful professional space where we respect each other. Please. Can we consider that at everything you say, discuss gently, engage in deep debate, but in such a way that you're always respectful? If we create this space, a professional discourse, where we are ready to say, you know what, they probably didn't mean that to offend me, always say that of ourselves and always say, okay, I might not have understood you, please check, and have careful discussions, we will enrich ourselves. 
I think Martin Robinson, Laura McInerney are just two examples of people who do that really, really well. Respectful, careful, always challenging, never, never trying to offend, and I just think we should all do that so much more. I'm not saying don't debate, I actually say debate more, but I think we'll do more by not creating these little funny echo chambers. You know when they kind of go, oh, did you see she said that and he said that and then that blog and wasn't that ridiculous, ha ha ha. Oh no, have you seen them? Oh, they're all enemies and they're really evil. And, oh, boo. Um, which is unfortunately a lot of Twitter, isn't it? It's just so depressing. Um, keep coming to research, Ed. From the first of these to now, boy, have we made a lot of difference. Let's come, let's keep challenging, let's think deeper. Let's say, where can we apply more research? Um, Defend your rights. Mary Bowstead of the ATL Union said this recently. Defend your right to make pedagogical decisions. Quite right, we should. As teachers, we should be making our own pedagogical decisions because we're professionals. But let's be way more critical of them. No one should ever say, oh, I have a right to do whatever I like in my classroom. Everyone should say, you have every right to question what I do, hold me to account, ask me to explain myself carefully about every decision I make, but ultimately it's my professional decision. That's the balance we need to get to, I think. Um, and let's get involved in system change. Every single person in here should be saying, let's reshape the system to embed all these ideas. So, schools. You've got to learn to live in un with uncertainty. If you'd like to know how good your teachers are, you're not going to be able to. That's it. You just can't. Um, I surprised someone yesterday by saying, I'm sorry, you're all going around and doing, you're not doing lesson grade, uh, graded lesson observations, and yet somehow later on you tell everyone a grade just through gathering rich evidence, and you still give them a grade. And I'm sorry, you have no idea. I mean, the best research suggests you might just be able to approximately identify your best 10% of teachers, maybe a bottom 10% of teachers, everyone in the middle. You just don't know who's better than who. You just don't. Stop pretending that you do. Stop basing systems on the assumption you need to know. You know, stop, uh, this is a particular irritation of mine. This child has been getting Bs the whole year and she gets to sick form and they say, well, you've got a C in your GCSE, so I'm sorry, you can't come in. Whereas actually we know, talk to Amanda Spielman and she'll say, well, actually each grade is plus or minus one. You know so much more than we do. Stop pretending that that's certainty. It's not certainty. Use your own professional opinions, for goodness sake, and call it as it is. We need to stop this ridiculous toxicity of fake certainty in our schools that means that we think this has worked, this hasn't worked. We must know if it has worked. On the other side of things, don't just say, oh, everything's uncertain, I can do everything I like, I'm going to stop exploring. That's possibly even worse to say, well, what we need to do is embrace the uncertainty and say, right, I'm going to constantly explore, constantly question. It's quite exciting when you get there, actually, to that point that isn't at the two extremes. Um, deeply professional workplaces, where we treat people not as, as Eric said in his earlier session, which I thought was brilliant, sort of naughty children, naughty teachers who are just bad and we're going to have to kind of keep observing you until you're better. Professional trust, workplaces where people flourish, I'm very excited because we've got 140 schools in our network where they're all kind of saying, yeah, this sounds exciting, I like this idea, we want to try and do this better. And they're beginning to say, how can we drop this certainty and how can we change our systems in a way? How can we build the respect? And you know what, we're really excited when we hear Dame Alison Peacock talk about this rich environment of professional learning and the respect in which she holds her staff and her children. We'll do that too. Let's get together, let's join these things, let's, let's make sure we change. Um, and when people say they're experts, start questioning them more. Schools, you really can't pick up, you know, a little flyer that says someone is going to tell you. What was the one that was going around on Twitter the other day? How to teach bottom sets or something. Um, how do you know that person is any good? Like, is it really enough to see someone said, hmm, has been a facilitator for a long time and worked in an outstanding school? I'm sorry, that's a pathetic level of evidence that that person knows what they're talking about. Unfortunately, we also live in the most decentralised, unregulated CPD market in the entire world. So every head teacher is supposed to just randomly understand if this person is good or not. But let's start questioning more deeply. And then finally, and this is where people oh, of course he'd talk about that, wouldn't he? Um, I've already mentioned it. I just so strongly believe if we build professionalism and respect into the way we develop as teachers, if we create career paths, where I can become an incredibly expert general practitioner or an expert in reading or an expert in behaviour or an expert in a creative art curriculum. 
if we have ways that we can acknowledge each other's expertise, share on it, draw upon it, if we can share our professional learning in ways that we decide are the ways that we want to accredit and validate, if we share the research and we translate it for each other and do that within our own professional body, we will enrich the profession. And I genuinely believe that. And I truly believe that one of the most important things happening in education right now is this drive to create a college of teaching to enrich our profession and not create a whole bunch of people who tell us how to teach, but to grab hold of that momentum and do something with it. And secondly, how do we transform our workplaces, make every single school somewhere exciting, enriching, professionally, uh, with professional trust, enriched with evidence? I was really pleased to be asked by the DfE, look, we want you to do a, an expert group on this. So we want to put together a new teacher's professional development standard. But we don't want to sit in a room and say, oh, we know better than all of you. We're reaching out. We want to work with the profession. We're launching a call for evidence on Monday. And we want everyone to get engaged and say, what's going to enrich your professional learning? How can we really overcome these barriers, these terrible barriers of time and lack of respect that we sometimes see in schools? Please work with us. Let's enrich it. Let's make it happen together. And then finally, let's take the wonderful things we have now. There's a reason our system does quite well. There really is. The teaching schools, this could be such a wonderful thing. I don't think we're quite there yet, but many teaching schools are doing brilliant things. Let's get them a bit more specialised. Let's maybe make sure that we're in encouraging them to get more specialists directly in. But I, we can build so much on that. Some of our special schools, some of our alternative provision, they have such amazing experts in dealing with educational needs and behaviour. Let's make sure that's truly linked. Let's draw on that from the mainstream much more strongly. Let's support them much better and create much smoother links between the two so it's not just who you get to palm off to different sorts of units. We can build on all these wonderful things that are happening because we are already innovative and creative and we can get this great, deep, passionate professionalism so my hope is you will have a look at some of these links. You will never think about cooking a steak in the same way again. Most importantly, if there is a phrase that underpins everything, it is a renaissance of educational scholarship. Let's get depth. Let's get deep thought. And let's reclaim the profession and embed the evidence within it. Thank you very much. Four minutes, four minutes, I think. Has anyone got any questions? Start questioning deeply why and how. Come on, let's go. <laughs> anyone got any questions? Yes. It is. Yes. Uh, so I think it's hugely difficult to regulate whether CPD is delivering the right things until we've decided what the right things are. So actually, people say to me, oh, can you tell me if this CPD is good? And I said, well, you show me the evidence base that clearly says within this field what the more effective approaches are, then we can start quality assuring it, can't we? We can quality assure the delivery of it, whether they're using the right approaches. We have a strong evidence base for what makes great professional development. In fact, Philip accordingly led some research, and uh, Rob Coe was involved in this as well. Our developing great teaching report summarizes very clearly what makes great professional development, but actually the content is very difficult to do. I think in other countries, they just kind of say, look, this is our best guess. You need to talk about that in more cases. But I agree, we don't want to stifle innovation. So let's have a sort of a, a small c conservative approach to it, where we say, these are things we're definitely sure we should be saying more of. These are things we definitely should no longer be hearing about. And in the middle, well, we're going to take a cautious approach to regulating that. That would be my, my opinion. But yeah, let's help, let's help schools with that. Let's start thinking. College of Teaching will be looking at that, I believe. That's in the blueprint. Any other questions? Yes. Rob Coe. <laughs> uh, convincing evidence for, uh, for uh, grading teachers, or for not grading teachers. Where is the convincing evidence? Do you mean convincing as in it will convince your head teacher? Yes, OK. Uh, Have a look at Rob's blog on this. Yeah, it's really, it, it is true. Unfortunately, we also know the way we take on evidence is 
here are my beliefs and I'll take on the evidence that works with those and I won't take on the evidence that doesn't work with that. So if they genuinely believe they've become a great professional through grading lessons, it's going to be very hard to change that. We need to give people gentle paths down from their high horse. But yeah, now it's a good point. Start looking at what uh, Rob's sort of summaries of the research in this area. Nobody should be allocating lesson grades and claiming anything other than, you know, this is what we think now, could be plus minus one. But you know, this whole idea that, right, you've got that grade, capability, dangerous, toxic, nonsense. Happy to say it to your head. Um, yes, last question. Yes, lady at the back. Do you see anything that governors and trustees should do to create the culture? Yes. So, uh, governors and trustees should be asking much more in, uh, deeper questions about the workplace learning. Never ever be given a list of CPD courses your staff have been sent on. Send it back immediately and say, I don't want to know about that. I want to know about what's the workplace learning, how are people collaborating. Uh, there's an article the National Governors Association published, which I wrote and was helping with. Um, there is, I would suggest your school would join our network and go through an audit, or Cure have an audit, or the Institute of Education have an audit. Get your school actually in, sort of looked at in some more depth. Again, don't attach a massive certainty that that judgment is absolutely correct, correct but it will give you lots more information about how you can start questioning that, that senior leadership team. Um, I, I, it is half past. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, look forward to having any more of your questions later. Thank you.